Okay, ready for more? <laughs> um, so, so if you've been here this morning, you heard all kinds. Of, we've heard about how to calculate effect sizes in general. We talked about fixed random effects. And now, sort of going back to the issue of calculating effect sizes, this is a very specialized topic. Um, and, but it's, it was, it's one, of, one of the things that sort of has been driving some people crazy in terms of when, when doing a, a synthesis, when they find a, a clustered randomized trial. So when instead of individuals being randomly assigned to a treatment, we have schools or clinics or groups of people being randomly assigned. And it's never been super clear how to deal with that issue. So I'm actually going to talk to you um, in the next hour and 15 minutes about how we calculate an, eff an effect size from a clustered randomized trial. So, so we're sort of moving back now to uh, the first thing we did this morning and, and look at a very specialized topic. Um, but um, hopefully this will help if you run. And, and the fact of the matter is there's a lot more clustered randomized trials out there. And we want to make sure we can include all the studies we possibly can into our synthesis. So, OK. So this should look familiar. And I have arrows. Um, this should look familiar. Um, this is an experimental study. If we're interested in the difference between the treatment and control group, this is our standardized mean difference. Um, as David said this morning, we usually use the letter D for that estimate. Um, and it's in the numerator is the difference between the treatment and the control group. And the denominator is the pooled standard deviation across the two groups. So that's what, um, and so what we're going to be talking about today is just how to calculate a standardized mean difference effect size, something similar to this, when you have a clustered trial. Okay. And there's our, the variance of our standardized mean difference. Um, this should look familiar from this morning. We see what we have there are, what's in there are the sample sizes for the treatment and control group, the NT, the NC. Those are the sample sizes for the treatment and control group. And then the effect size is also in there. OK. And this is just my little schematic. So we have estimates in the treatment group. We have a bunch of measurements from the treatment group. We get an overall treatment mean. We have estimates from the control group, the overall control group mean. Each of them have their own standard deviation. And we pool that for the, the S squared pooled is, the, is now the denominator of our standardized mean difference. So this is in our simplest case when we just have two groups, a two-group experimental study. Okay. But in clustered randomized trials, our standardized mean difference is going to be more complex. Okay. So we have, if we have individuals um, within clusters, okay, so they might be schools, they might, they're already existing schools or clinics, and then we randomly assign those schools or classrooms or clinics to a treatment and control group. Now we have a number of different means. We have the means of each cluster. So we have school means, or we have clinic means, classroom means. We also have the overall mean for all the treatment group clusters and all the control group clusters. And then we have all kinds of variances. We have variances within each group or cluster, within each school. We have the variance among the cluster means. And then we have the overall variance um, but just the total variance of all the observations. So the question is, um, how do we calculate the effect size? Pardon me? Yeah, there are Not yet. I don't think. Maybe they're not. Um, we have, say, in the treatment group here on the left side, we have a set of observations that come from different clusters. So we have that first group, cluster one, and then we might have up to M, T clusters. Okay. And for now, which makes everything more simple, we're going to assume that every cluster has the same sample size. Okay, so we have the same number of people within each school or within each classroom. Um, so we have a set of n observations in cluster 1 in the treatment group, a set of n observations in cluster m sub t. We have the same in the control group, but there we have a total of m c clusters. Then each cluster has its own mean. We have y bar t, one dot, meaning the mean of the first cluster. In the treatment group, the mean for the um, m teeth cluster in the, um, in the treatment group, and the same thing for the control groups. 
And then we have overall treatment and control means. Okay. Um, so could you just go back one? Yeah. So our diff so what we really want is something that represents the difference between the treatment and the control group, right? Um, for our effect size. Okay. But again, what is the then what's the appropriate mean? You know, it, is it the overall mean? Is it the cluster mean? Is um, and what variance are we going to use? Are we going to use the total variance? Are we going to use the variance across the cluster means? Are we going to use the within group, the within cluster variance? What, what is this effect size going to look like and what does it mean? So, um, go ahead. So, so in, before I, we get to the, and it's going to take me a little while to get to the effect size. But, so before we get to that, that point, I want to show you sort of what the different components of variance that could possibly be used in an effect size and talk a little bit more about the structure of the data in order for us to get to the point where I can show you what the options are for the kind of standardized mean difference you might get in a clustered trial. Okay. So what I'm going to show you are three different, as I mentioned before, there are three different components of variation in a clustered trial. Um, and um, and these, if you're familiar with hierarchical linear models, these are, these are the same, same variances we talk about in hierarchical linear models. Okay. So our first component of variance is within the within cluster variance. So this would be the within school variation or the within clinic variation. Um, and it's, and it, we calculate it as the pool differences between each observation and its cluster mean. Um, and I'll show you an illustration in a second. This is what it looks like. Just to remember, because I always have to remind myself, we're going to use the capital M to indicate the total number of clusters. Uh, so the total number of schools or clinics, whatever that might be. MT and MC are the individual numbers of clusters within the treatment and control group. Um, our total sample size is capital N. And we're assuming equal sample sizes within each group of a small, that would be lowercase n. And so we get um, our total sample size by taking n times mt plus n times mc, and we get a total, um, our total cluster sample sizes. So the, the, the one thing that's unfortunate here is that the, you know, we have so many letters and things floating around. But, okay. So in graphic terms, and this is where my, my daughter said, Mom, there's too many things flying in your slides. So here we go. So this is an illustration of the, um, of the within cluster um, vari variation. You're laughing too. OK, so we have each, keep going. <laughs> we have each cluster. So we have, we have each, each of the individual, um, within each cluster, each individual observation and its difference from its cluster mean. <laughs> See, too much stuff flying. Okay, um, and then what, what we get there then is um, pulling that across all the means we have our within cluster variance. Okay, there's more things that fly, Josh. <laughs> so, and we call, again, See, it should listen to my daughters, right? Um, so we, we use the, we say S squared W, so W is our within cluster vari variation. Okay, so that's within each group. And typical analysis of variance fashion, we're assuming that they're, it's similar across groups. Okay. I'm telling you. <laughs> Went a little crazy on that. Okay. A second component of variation is the between cluster mean variation. Um, so here we have the differences between each cluster mean and the total treatment group or control group mean. So it's the difference it's the variation among the means of the clusters. And we're going to call that between S squared B, the between, the between group variation, the between cluster variation. Okay. And so that is, um, yeah, that is the variation of each of those cluster means from the total mean. You can keep going because it's, I think this is all the flying I have going. Here. So this is our, our, our now our, our, um, our variance between groups, between clusters. Okay. And then finally we have our total pooled within group, our total variance, which is each individual observation 
from the tot from the um, the grand from it, their associated grand mean of their group, um, and so that is that from these. Okay. So again, we have these three components of variation. We have within groups, within our clusters or schools or clinics. We have between the means of our, um, the, the cluster means, and then we have the total, the difference between our individuals and um, the, the grand um, means. Okay. So a little bit more. It's a little bit of distribution theory, which helps a little, just so we can, Again, because I need to add, you know, more characters here for, to confuse you, but um, we're going to assume, like we always do, these are our usual assumptions, that every observation within the treatment and the control group is normally distributed. It has a mean of mu. Um, it has, it's distributed around its cluster mean, which is mu sub i t, and we have this equal within-group variance, sigma squared w, um, and, uh, and so forth. So that's our, our distribution assumptions of our individual observations. Okay. And then our, then our mu's themselves also come from a distribution. We also assume that they're um, normally distributed, and they're normally distributed about the, the grand mean, the mean of the total, the treatment group mean and the control group mean, and um, their variance is the same, and it's what we, the between group variation between mean separation. Okay. And we get this. This is very important. <laughs> so our total variation, so the variance of each of the individual observations from their respective um, group mean is equal to our within group variation, our cluster variation plus the between, um, the between means variation. Okay? So why is this important? It's important for the next thing. <laughs> um, Again, there are lots of details. Of, you know, I still haven't given you an effect size yet, but we're getting there. Um, we, also, we also have this other parameter that's really important. And this is our intra-class correlation. Um, we usually use the rho to indicate that. And what we can think about it is really as the ratio of the, vari the variation that occurs between the cluster means and the total. So how much of the total variation is actually between clusters, is actually between schools or between clinics or between whatever group we have that we have, that we have in our clustered sample, okay? Um, and that's as a fraction of the total variation. So we usually get some fraction, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, whatever it might be, that tells us how much of the, the total variation is actually variation that's between groups, okay? Okay. Um, and why is it important? Well, we're going to need this. We are going to need this to calculate the, our, our effect size, our clustered effect size, eventually. Um, and it also helps because we know that um, the interclass correlation coefficient is made up of all those components of variation. So if we have, we have one of two of these things, if we have either the, we have one, we have two, two of the um, quantities here. We can calculate the other one. So it's important that, um, that, we, that we understand this particular um, relationship. Okay. Okay, so we have looked at the structure of the data. Okay, so we've got, we've got individual observations nested within clusters, schools or treatment centers or clinics. And it's those clinics or treatments or centers that are or schools that get randomly assigned a treatment or control group. Then each of our clusters has means, um, and then we take the grand mean of the treatment of the control group, and we, want, we, we need an effect size that gives us some indication of what the overall difference is between the treatment and control group, while also being sensitive to the nature of the data. Okay, so we've seen what the underlying distributions are, and we've also seen how the variance components relate to one another. Okay. So now we're gonna, and now I'm going to talk about how we estimate the variance components, and then I can tell you how to get the effect sizes. Okay, easiest one, the estimate of the within cluster variation. We just use our our estimate of the of 
of the within cluster um, sa sample variance. So that, I showed you that estimator a couple slides ago. The, you know, sample, the sampling distribution, the sampling variance based on the difference between each individual observation and its cluster um, mean. Okay. In order to get the estimate of the between, tree, the, the between cluster means, it's not as, as easy as just taking the sample variance of the, of the means, cluster means. In fact, um, that, that, the estimator I showed you a couple slides ago for S squared sub B, so that would be that variation of the diff, of between each of the cluster means and their grand mean is not, um, is not an estimate of our underlying um, between group variance. It actually has another, it has some of the within group cluster variance in it. So the expect, so really um, we need to get a good estimate of sigma squared B without any of that sigma squared W in there. Okay. So this is then our estimator for sigma squared B. We take our estimate, our sampling estimate of the differences between the means, the variance of the cluster means, and we subtract off that little piece that indicate that is part of the within group variation. Okay. And that little n, go back for a second, that little n is our cluster sample size. And we're assuming equal sample sizes within clusters. Okay. Um, and then given what we just saw, we can actually solve for the total um, vari variation we can estimate with this. Again, the sum of the between and the within group um, sample variances with some, um, some sampling, well, some of the, um, the sample size in there too. Okay. Okay, so now we're ready. Okay. Because if you remember, our standardized mean difference has the difference between the means and the numerator, and it has some variance in the denominator. And it's that variance in the denominator that makes these clustered effect sizes a little more complicated. So, as you might guess, we have three different, um, we have three different components of variation in that structure of data we have. So we actually have three different possible effect sizes. Okay. And the choice among them depends on what your other studies are like in your meta-analysis. Because what you want to get is a, um, Usually you're not going to have a whole bunch of studies that are all clustered trials. You're going to get all kinds of stuff. We know that. But you need to then pick an effect size that is going to be most comparable to the ones you have in the rest of your data set. Okay. Um, and so that's what I mean by the choice among them depends on the research design and also on the information you have given to you in the other studies. Okay. Okay. The most common effect size that we usually get from a cluster trial is what we're going to call delta W. And, and it's, so it's under um, the, the, the theoretical, the population version of this is the two, um, the two underlying means for the treatment and control group divided by the within cluster variance. Okay. Estimated by what we'd expect which is our treatment and control means, and then the standard deviation of our pooled within cluster variation. Okay. Um, you might be asking me, so just go back one. You might be asking me, well, how do we know what all this stuff is? I have two examples in a second to show you. Okay. So the, up, um, the variation is really, and they get worse and worse as we go on. So there's no way you're going to memorize this or know what these things are, but but you see, um, some of this should look familiar. That first term is actually the same term as we have in our normal standardized mean difference. That second piece there is sort of a sampling correction. You see that we have both the sample size of the cluster and the interclass correlation coefficient in there. So our variation for our, the, the variance for our effect, for, our, for the DW is going to depend on the cluster size, and the interclass correlation. If we have no variation between groups, then it turns out that this thing all just, just um, simplifies back down 
So that first variance I showed you, our typical standardized mean difference variance. Okay. So we would, um, we would normally choose this one if all of our other studies are typical single site studies. Just we have a treatment in a control group, um, and we, it only happened in one place, and all the rest of our, most of our other effect sizes in our studies are just a single, a single site study. Okay. Um, we have a second estimator that we call delta T. Um, so this is, again, the, the numerators of these don't change, it's the denominator that does. So it's the difference in the two population um, means divided by the total variation. Okay. When all of our other studies are also multi-site studies, we might want to use this particular one. Okay. Um, there are two ways to calculate this particular effect size, and this depends on what kind of information is given to you in a study. Anyone who's done a meta-analysis, and we don't have the person in the green shirt here, but you know every study gives you different stuff. So, you have, so we have lots of ways to calculate these things depending on what information we're given. If we get both the um, between the sampling um, variance for the between group means and the within cluster variance, then we have one way of calculating. If we only get the total variance, so the variance at the level of the individual observations um, and the interclass correlation, we use the second method. Okay, so this is what they look like. Um, so the total, uh, we have the two, we have the treatment group mean and the control group mean divided by the total variance, and we estimate the total variance with the between and the within group variance if we have them. Okay. Um, if we don't have those, oh, and that's the, that's, <laughs> that's the variance, so, you know, again, sample sizes and interclass correlation coefficient and size and numbers of clusters and total sample sizes, that's all in there. Okay. Um, if we only have the total variation and the interclass correlation, we can still calculate that using this formula. So basically we're adjusting that our sampling, our total sampling um, sa standard deviation with our interclass correlation, the sample size, and the, and the um, cluster size. Okay. And then there's that variance, also messy. Okay. We also have, um, so we have the, the DW, which we is usually typically you is, is comparable to our typical single site studies. We have, we have D sub T, which is comparable to other studies that might be also be multi-site studies so that we can get, um, we have to this total variance. Um, we also have another one based on, as we might expect, the between treatment mean, between cluster mean variance. Okay. So we might use this if, and I could not come up with, you know, it was hard for me to understand what this might be since I am a statistician, not a substantive researcher, but what, um, if we have a treatment effect that's actually defined at some level of the cluster, not quite sure what that would be, but if, if, if really the cluster means are our focus, then we might use this one. Um, however, um, it's not as commonly used, but it is one that might be more easily ob obtainable. We might get the information for this more likely than some of the information we need for the other effect sizes. So we need to know what this is so that we can use it to get to the effect size we want. Okay. So again, just like in the, the D sub T, we have two different ways of calculating this. Um, and we have one, if we have the between group variation and the within cluster variation, we can use this particular um, estimator. But if, um, and there's a variance again. Um, and, but if we have um, only the between group, the between uh, the sample, the between cluster means sample standard deviation or variance, and the interclass correlation, we can use this. Okay. So now you should be saying there's a, um, oh, very important. Again, if we have any one 
if we have the interclass correlation and any one of the effect sizes, we can get one of the other ones. Okay. So now you may be asking me, okay, great, theoretically, this is, this is what happens. How do we even get this? So, I mean, how do we calculate this? How do we find this stuff? Okay. So we've looked at the structure of the data. We've seen the different components of variation. We've defined estimators for those different things that might go in the denominator. And we've also outlined the computation of these three different kinds of effect sizes and their variances. Okay. Um, so I'm about to give you a couple examples uh, sort of before we get there. Of course we know things are never that simple. Um, we often have unequal cluster sample sizes. There are formulas for that. If I tried to put them up here, I'd be going off on slides. I mean, the slides would be outrageous. <laughs> They're bad enough. Um, so we, we sometimes assume equal cluster sizes anyway, because that's usually what you, the, the primary researcher intended. Okay? But we do, so then, again, the, I know, fudging a little, but we take conservative estimates of those, of those sample sizes. And I'll show you, I have two examples for you in a second. Okay. Um, sometimes we don't get the interclass correlation coefficient, which is the bigger problem. So we can estimate it from a number of sources. I can, I can, I have give you a couple sources here um, that, that might give you at least a ballpark estimate of it. Some of the more recent studies using cluster randomized trials do give this to you. If you're using, you know, older studies might not give it to you. People are more aware of the importance of this now, and they give you that intraclass correlation coefficient, or you can get it from, from the study itself. Okay. Okay, so let's look at an example. So this is a, um, and I put the year on here, oh, the 2010. Um, this is a cluster randomized trial on the effect of a, a program called, I think, Positive Action. So it was a, so it was a character development program. It had all kinds of um, possible outcomes. Um, this particular study looks only at the academic ones um, and absenteeism and, um, multi, um, and disciplinary outcomes. Okay. So from the analysis section, I see this, school-level raw mean. Okay, so, oh, I'm going to, so right now, it looks like the analysis is going to be at the level of the school. The particular um, intervention was randomly assigned to schools. Okay. So, looks like I'm going to get raw means for school, for the school level stuff. So, now I'm going to, I know I'm going to get cluster means. Okay. And then, and then I, I you know, just to make sure, I noticed that they're going to and they analyzed it using matched pairs. So, and the matched pairs were the were the schools. So they actually had 10 schools in the treatment group, 10 schools in the control group. They were matched. So now I know that I've got um, I'm going to get information at the school level at least, and I know that there's 10 in each in each group. Okay, 10 schools. And look, they actually gave me the interclass correlation. So um, they, did, they did an HLM model, and the um, unconditional, I'm looking now for the unconditional model, and we've got um, the ICC, which is our, our interclass correlation, um, is 0 0.72, 0 0.65, 0 0.87, 0 0.72 for four different outcomes. Okay. But this is, and so I'm going to take, we're going to look at the math SAT outcome. Is so far so good, you two? <laughs> they are really large, and, and that's why I picked the example. <laughs> no, yeah, by the way, you never get ICCs this large. These are huge. There's a lot of variation between the groups here. These are huge. I agree. So I know they. I looked at them many, many times. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Um. Okay, so then I thought, okay, wait, I've got, I've got the ICCs. I think I'm going to get this cluster means. I know how many clusters. Where's the sample size for the cluster? So I, I could not find it in the paper. So, um, so then I thought, well, okay, 
Maybe there's an unpublished report somewhere, I can find it. This is a typical thing that happens when we're trying to do research synthesis. Well, I found another paper that was actually on the other outcomes of this particular um, treatment. And um, they were looking at substance abuse, violent behaviors, and sexual activity. Same, same, um, same study, different set of outcomes, published in a different place. And um, they actually said they had 976 intervention students and 738 control students. It looks like the same study. We have matched pair, cluster randomized with 10 intervention and 10 control, so I'm just going to go with it. <laughs> so, okay, so what do we have so far? Oh, and then here's my, so, and then um, in the original paper, here was the, um, the means that they gave me. Um, and they say somewhere that these are based on the, the school means, okay? So we've got, um, we're going to use the standardized test, and we've got for this the post-test, the means and standard deviations for the control group and for the positive action um, intervention group, okay? So this is what I've got so far. <laughs> I've got my, I got my interclass correlation coefficient, that big 0.72. I know I have 10 matched pairs of schools. Um, the treatment group has 976. The control group has 738. I'm going to take a conservative guess. I'm just going to take 738 divided by 10, and I'm going to use that as my sample size, because um, I'm not going to waste any more time looking for the sample size. Um, and then I know I have my means of this, my school means, the means of my schools here. Um, and so I have, these means are at the level of the school. So I know they're analyzing at the level of the school. So this is the mean of my cluster mean. Okay. So, so I have, what it turns out is I have all the information I need to compute DB2. This might not be the one I want, but I know I can calculate this and then I can get to the one I want. Okay. So um, I can, I know that I'm, I'm assuming, oh, I have, I have equal clusters, okay, 10 schools in each, just going to take the general, they, I'm going to get my, um, my pooled um, between group variance, which I'm just taking as basically an average of the two variances, because I have equal, two, two clusters that are the same size. I get my S sub B, um, then I have my, my overall um, difference between my treatment and control group divided by my S sub B, and then with that adjustment that includes the sample, that includes the, I, the um, interclass correlation coefficient and the, um, what I'm assuming is my equal cluster, 73, and I get an effect size of 0.48. Okay, so then I, um, this could be totally wrong, this calculation. Um, I always tell, and Josh has heard this many times, I'm really bad at adding and subtracting. <laughs> and so this could, I mean, this could be totally off. We don't know. We're just going to pretend that's okay. <laughs> um, but we can see we have our, what, what goes into this particular variance our cluster, are the cluster, numbers of clusters, the num the, my assumed equal sample size, within clusters and my, um, my uh, ICC, okay. So given that, I can actually get some of the other ones. So if this is my only clustered trial in my meta-analysis, and I have a whole bunch of single site studies that are just looking at um, a positive, this positive action intervention in one school versus another school, then I want to get my DW, and I can just use the formulas I've given you to find out what that is. Okay, um, and I get an effect size of 0.77, and the next one gives, um, and I can use that same transformation that I used for my um, effect size. A couple slides ago, I showed you how to go from one effect size to another. I can use that to also go from one variance to another, um, and I get a, vari a standard deviation here of 0.74. So just go back one. So I've got an effect size of 0.77, a standard deviation of 0.74. There's, is there an effect here? No. 
I have a standard deviation that's almost the same size as my effect size. So really, this effect size is not different from zero. Okay. If instead I wanted the, um, if, and, go ahead. So if instead I wanted the total, the D total, and I might have a bunch of, and th in this particular case, there is a, a couple of clustered, a couple of clustered trials on this particular intervention. Um, then maybe I want to compare the total, the D total. Um, again, go through all the, all the um, uh, calculations. This time I get an effect size of 0.41, but in my standard deviation, look at my standard deviation. So in essence, these might look very different from one another in terms of their absolute value, but none of them are different from zero. We're all coming to the same conclusion that this particular treatment on the SAT math is not effective, no matter what effect size I've calculated. We can also see that they're very different. They, they, at least the effect size is very different from, um, the value of it seems very different from each other, but with the standard deviation, we see that we wouldn't interpret them any differently from each other. Okay. This is because the interclass correlation is so big, <laughs> too. There's so much variation between the schools that we can't figure out what's, what, if they're, what, what the difference actually is. And so none of our effect sizes that we've calculated are different from zero. Okay. Um, and in this case, though, we, we have the interclass correlation reported, but this doesn't always happen. So my next, next example is shows you what we do when we don't have the interclass correlation. Okay, so this is a, um, this is a randomized, this is a cluster randomized trial on um, physical activity. So you can see here, I just pulled this out of um, the paper again. Here we have 4,905 children. They actually give us the sample size, and we have 24 schools, and we have 14 intervention and 10 control schools. So we're, we have um, the intervention at the school level, okay, um, and uh, randomized to the school level. So we know we have a cluster trial. School is going to be our cluster, okay. Um, we think now we might actually get individual level data because I read, read this, when I read this, I says, okay, we've got um, these measures of physical activity um, from observations taken in the control and treatment schools. Um, they, we did these observations on, on that many students. And so I'm thinking, oh, uh, this is beginning to me, makes me think that maybe what I'm gonna get in the table are actually not not the mean of the cluster means, but the actual mean of the individual observations at the, um, for the treatment and control group. So here's my, my table, and when I look at the ends, those are not 14 and 10. Those are 3,429 and 1,047. So I guess what I'm really getting is the mean and the standard deviation um, uh, that these are at the level of the individual, and my standard deviation is at the also at the level of the individual. So these are, would be what we would call S total for the treatment and the control group, okay? Okay, so what do I have so far? So I've got 14 schools in the treatment group, 10 schools in the control group. I have um, my, my sample size average, because if I'm gonna continue with this I suppose fantasy right now <laughs> that I have equal clusters. Um, I'm gonna just, I have about 244 um, in the um, treatment group, 104 in the control group, and I'm really living a fantasy now, but we're just gonna go with it. Um, so, but I, so I know I've got, so I've got something that might approach an N. I'm probably gonna take a conservative number like 103. I have individual I may have the means calculated from the individuals, not from the groups, and I have the standard deviations, which I also think are from the individual level. But I don't have the interclass correlation, and I don't have other estimates of the variance. I don't have the estimates of within school variance. I don't have the estimates of the, with, of the between treatment um, means, so the between group means, school means. So I need, I either need two estimates of the variance or I need one estimate of the variance and the interclass correlation. Well, 
I could look for another source. And so there are some people who have very nicely done this work, knowing that um, mostly because we need to know the interclass correlation when we're, when we're calculating power for these trials before we start them. So there are a couple places where we might be able to find something close. Um, and I, I can give you, um, I, I, at the end of this presentation, I have a couple of sources for you to find interclass correlation coefficients that might at least give you a ballpark figure about how much variation might be between groups versus within groups. In education, we tend, that's why they're laughing over there, we tend to have much less variation between groups than we have within schools. The, with, the, the between school variation is much smaller usually than the within group. In that first example, we, it, it's sort of an anomaly. Um, but at any rate, um, Hedges and Hedberg have a paper that goes through and gives a bunch of ICCs for different academic outcomes using, um, using some of the national data sets we have in the US. Um, this is one that looks at uh, group randomized trials with health outcomes. Um, and so in that particular paper, they looked at the average um, interclass correlation coefficient for cohort studies that looked at um, things that were related to diet. And the upper bound of those um, interclass correlations was 0 0.03. So I'm going to take that as my example. And I'm going to write all this stuff down when I'm calculating my effect size. OK. So we get this. We get an effect size of 2.59. Here, once I put everything in, um, do all my calculations, um, again, these who knows? If you go home and figure out it's wrong, please email me. <laughs> um, OK. Um, and then we have this variance calculation, <laughs> which is a mess, and which I did many times and got different answers. So I stopped. <laughs> so what I've given you, all we've talked about so far is just about standardized mean difference. Nothing, nothing about the other effect sizes. So um, what we can doesn't mean we can't throw them out. If we happen to be um, looking at odds ratios, for example, and so what we can do is do what um, what what we've been doing up to this point, and that is to adjust the sample size for the clusters. Okay, um, and I'm going to show you what sort of what the Cochrane Handbook um, suggests you do. And when in this particular case, using an odds ratio. So what we do in the Cochrane Handbook is we calculate what, uh, what we call a design effect. So this is going to be our adjustment for the fact that um, we might get, we might end up with these, the effect size we might have to work with may be based on some individual level data, but we know that they come from clusters. So we're not, we're not recognizing the clusters in that, in that effect size, and we may be getting too precise of a, too small of a, of a variance and too big of a difference if we're not recognizing the fact that each of our observations are actually nested in some cluster. So what we're actually going to do is adjust our sample sizes and, our, and what we get for our effect size based on the fact that we actually, um, knowing how many clusters we have and how many sample, how, what the sample size is within each cluster. So we calculate this design effect, which has in it the average cluster sample size and also the interclass correlation coefficient. Okay. And what we're going to do then is we're going to adjust our, actually we're going to, actually for the odds ratio, we're going to adjust our sample size down on the basis of this design effect. And that will, of course, affect our variance, make our variance um, bigger, too, because we have to acknowledge and take sort of you know, a hit for the fact that we're not, we're not actually looking at individual level data. Our data is actually clustered. And so, OK. So um, this is also from that same um, positive action program. This is from this, the, thank God I found the study because you know, to get the sample sizes, because I also had um, dichotomous outcomes in here. 
So for our control group and our treatment group, we have the number of kids who smoked a cigarette after the end of the, the treatment some, at some post-test time. These are fifth graders. Um, okay. So they give us the fact that we had, um, we had 738 in the control, 976 in the intervention. 7.6% of the control group smoked a cigarette after, at the post-test date, 4% of the intervention group. So I would get my two-by-two two table that looks like this. 39 in the intervention group and 56 in the control group smoked a cigarette. And then we have the, um, the group that didn't smoke a cigarette. Okay. Um, and nicely, nicely, they gave me my, my interclass correlation coefficient. Much more on the order of what we expect. Um, so in this case, for the substance abuse, by substance use, um, the ICC was 0.05. Okay, so what I do is now, I take my two by two table, I calculate my design effect, I take my two by two table, I divide my number, my, I divide my sample sizes by that design effect. Um, so my average cluster size is about 85. We had um, 20, we had 10, remember we had 10 matched pairs of treatment and control schools. Our sample size is up there, so my average cluster size is 85.7. My design effect, given my um, interclass correlation coefficient, is that. And boy, I hope that's right. And um, then I get my sample sizes. And you can see that my sort of effective sample sizes are all smaller, right? I divide each of my, my sample sizes by by that now from this, this is the data I'm going to use to get my odds ratio. Okay. Um, because now it's adjusting, so we've adjusted down, my odds ratio is going to be um, affected obviously by the design effect. Okay. So I'm not getting, a, I'm not, I don't have as strong an effect as I would have if I didn't have clusters in there. Um, and then to get the variance, um, we, calcul we calculate the odds ratio. This is the original odds ratio, 1.97. I get its, um, I take the log odds of it, which is 0.68. Um, and then if you remember from this morning, which seemed like forever ago, I can calculate my variance for my log odds ratio, 0.046. The standard error is 0.214. And then I can adjust that. I adjust my, my, um, log odds rate, the variance of my log odds ratio from the original sample sizes to get my, um, my, my uh, adjusted um, standard error for my log odds ratio. Okay, I think I'm about there. So, okay, a lot of detail. No way you're going to walk out of here and know how to calculate one of these, you know, without this. Um, but here are the references. This, um, that first paper by Hedges has all of the details in there, including what happens when you have unequal sample sizes. So it, that gives you all the, um, the, the calculations for the, um, the effect size in a clustered, in a clustered, um, clustered trial um, when, you have, um, when you don't have equal cluster sizes. So what you have to do there is calculate all kinds of different harmonic means of sample sizes and so forth. Um, and then Hedges and Hedberg is the one I told you about that gives you a bunch of interclass correlation coefficients, at least in the educational context. Um, I think um, I gave you the Murray and Blitzstein reference in there too. These are all going to go up on the Campbell website, so you don't have to try to get that now. And then the Cochrane Handbook um, has a chapter on clustered effect sizes using the design effect option. So we still need to figure out um, how to do this with log odds ratios um, in the same way that Hedges did it for the, um, the, the uh, standardized mean difference. But for now, we can still use some kind of design adjustment and make sure again that when, before we do our meta-analysis that we flag these effect sizes. We calculated these in a different way, and we make sure we know what they are, because if they come up, they may come up as outliers, they may come up in some way that might be, um, we want to make sure we know which ones they are, in other words. So, um, 
and let me go back because i'm writing this down. okay, thank you very much.